First, I want to thank everybody for being here. Obviously, being back in Texas is super exciting. Um, I think this is a really an untapped region for our country for water polo. Obviously, with high school starting officially as a high school sport next year, it's really an exciting place to be. Obviously, um, under the circumstances, you know, our hope was to have a lot of coaches from Texas, but with COVID, we're, we're limited. So thank you guys for showing up. I'm going to take my mask off for this, and I uh, thank you guys for keeping yours on. So I think first... <clears throat> It's important to note, you know, this isn't uh, Adam Wright's creation or philosophy. This is really a compilation uh, of, I guess, my water polo life, um, starting uh, in, in the coaches who I've been under and affected me and my teammates and people that I've coached with, starting with age group. Some of the most important lessons I've learned uh, as an athlete and as a coach started back in Long Beach at age group. Um, obviously through high school, college, <clears throat> playing professionally, and then uh, with our national teams as well. So really, if there's any credit, it, it's to those that I was so fortunate um, to either play with, play under, or coach alongside with. So I think the goal today, ask me uh, to do this, um, you know, obviously there's a million different philosophies. One philosophy is right or wrong. Um, my goal is to cover, uh, and, and my belief is, is the fundamental aspect, keeping the game simple, um, is what can potentially put you in a position to be successful. So my goal today is to cover uh, the three phases of the game and try to simplify it. So trying to simplify the game uh, of water polo. So again, our goal today is to, to really try to simplify the game of water polo. Um, when looking at the whole game of water polo, uh, breaking it down, and the way I see the game is there's three phases in the game of water polo, right? And the three phases, something that's really important to, to notice is no one phase is really more important than the next. Um, any one of these given phases, an action, and any one of these given phases can absolutely have a positive and or a negative effect to the next phase. Um, and to go through these phases, so we have front court D, front court O, transition D, transition O, five on six, six on five. The reason why <coughs> uh, the three phases of the game are, are all connected, for example, and the reason why transition is in the middle is because this phase syncs up the two outside phases, whether it be front court or five on six, six on five. With that, for example, uh, uh, a way to positively have an impact on a given phase. So <clears throat> if we have a great front court attack, whether we score or don't, have a balanced attack, one side finishing, one side closing, it's gonna put us in a better position to have a good transition defense where we're not scrambling down, swimming side by side, which is probably gonna limit the amount of what that we have to play five on six, right? And on the flip side, if we have a great counter, we're probably putting the our opponent on their heels and they're scrambling, which puts us in a position, if we have a great counter with great structure, to get into a great front court with good balance, or maybe we catch them at the end of the transition going into the front court, and then we have a higher probability of playing six on five. So that's the way uh, you know, I break down the game into those three phases. Um, you know, A couple things on the game of water polo, I believe without a doubt it's the hardest game to play in the world. And uh, uh, the, the reality is, is we always talk about wanting to try to play an efficient game. When you're playing the hardest game in the world, the more efficient you can be, right, means the more oxygen per se you can have in your brain and the better decision making you can make, for example. So today, <clears throat> we're going to do a brief overview of each phase of the game. And, you know, I think some things that are important to note, the game of water polo too, and I always remember... Uh, from one of my coaches, Radko Rudich, he, he always equated it to the game of chess, right? And, and water polo is like a game of chess because not only are you plotting your given move, but you better be preparing your next two to three moves after that so you can go in for the kill. You know, and one thing as a player and as a coach um, that I think we've all been a part of is, you know, the game really never ends. And, 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 and we'll talk about this. One of the most vulnerable periods 
the game of water polo is when you're in the transition period from one phase to the next, whether it be a mental letdown or a physical letdown. And the game never truly ends. As soon as you think you're in a good position, you're not. And, uh, uh, and, and, and so many times in so many different team sports as well, as soon as the team thinks they have it, and in the last five seconds it's happened to us, on the highest of the levels at the NC2A finals, just when you think you got it, it gets away. So I think uh, the first phase and, and, and the, re the, the part that I'm going to spend more time on today because I feel like um, that's where we can really have a deeper dialogue. You know, everybody has their specific tactics in a front court or a five on six or a six on five. So we're really going to spend more time today on this middle phase, the transition phase. And I, I, and, and, and I really believe, again, I said no one phase is more important than the other, but this phase is critical because if, if you're good in this area, you're going to put yourselves in good positions on the two uh, phases out on the outside. So starting with transition, uh, a couple rules or standards um, that I think are really important to apply, right? First, the counterattack, okay, your counterattack defense always starts with your attack. It starts in your attack, and I'm sure everybody has heard this before. Some key things, obviously, in your attack, you really want to limit turnovers or lost balls. Those can lead to counterattacks the other way. Also, being proactive. Everybody, you have to be proactive, especially on the perimeter, making sure you're putting yourself in a good position. There's so many dynamic players now. If you let your guard down for one second, they're going to grab you and they're going to be gone. So being in a proactive and good position. Some key things we always talk about. It's a classic mistake in the game of water polo. You'll see probably this weekend all the time, people always watching their individual shots or a teammate's shot or watching a ball go into the center. And the reality is, is the game of water polo is a game of inches. It's a game of less than seconds. I watch a ball go into the center, my player stays with me, for example, and I'm watching, he has the ability to do what? To capture my arm, for example, and now maybe he's got a one on nobody. Or I'm watching my shot or my teammate's shot in the same situation. No side-by-side -side swimming. We, we, you know, uh, we know, okay, all of us have seen, you know, when you let a referee, right, and, and, and it's a hard game to call as an official. They might not see the first action, and they see the second action. And, but I always equate it to it's the player's fault for putting yourself into that position. So we say when possible we want to sprint and get at least five meters out in front. So if I'm on defense and the goal's behind me, I want to be five meters out in front of my opponent. If I swim side by side, so many different things can happen, right? Whether they grab you, duck under, the referee may not be watching that part of the court, and when they bring their attention back, all of a sudden, now you're out. And we don't want to take ejections in the transition. So we want to get out in front, on our back. If we can be on our back, the one thing we know is when we're on our back, our eyeballs are up and we have vision of everything, and we also have the ability to communicate. Then also with defense, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Obviously, you know, you really don't want to give up a one on nobody uh, or any sort of first line counter. But at a certain point, you're going to start working in unison as a team. And how you work in unison, how you begin that work early in the transition, right? We know in the game of water polo, the more passes, the more risk. You know, in age group and all these le different levels, we always hear make the extra pass. But the extra pass, if you think about it, is dangerous. You don't know, what if your player has sunscreen on his hand, Whoop, and the ball's gone? Why, why make a pass if you don't have to make a pass? So the more passes we can make a team make, the greater chance that they're going to make a mistake. Also, we know the more times a ball is being passed left to right, right to left, the slower their progress is going down the pool. Okay. Then <clears throat> also first line defenders, and we'll talk about first line and second line. But first line defenders, your goal when there's a back line counter or a second line counter, you know, there's so many opportunities where there's teams where if they don't have an advantage on the first line, a, uh, a one on nobody, a two on one, or a three on two, those players' commitments aren't at a level to get down the pool with 100% speed. So you have the ability, if you're a first line defender, to maybe slow down somebody who's coming on the back line, second line, a four on three, five on four, or six on five. We never want to cheat so much off the first line that we would allow a first line slam dunk because what's a higher percentage, a three on two or a four on three? Uh, and then also we will absolutely, we'll go through these things, we absolutely have the ability to dictate on defense and by the way we attacked in unison where we want the ball to be shot from. 
right? And then, you know, every, every coach, every team, you know, it's really important there's some sort of common language, right? Right means whether it's the goalies right or left, but everybody has to understand what right means and left means. So having, having a common language is really, really critical. You know, the last thing you want to do is have one player on their back and one on their stomach and you say right and they're going two different ways. Uh, always when we communicate, it's got to be loud, clear, and direct. You know, especially a lot of times it's your center, a lot of times coming up out of the backcourt, they're tired. Also pointing is key. And then, you know, uh, with our teams, we talk about no matter the distance we're down, we're going to chase hard every time, 100%. Bottom line is you don't want to give up counter goals. Bottom line is if you give up first line counter goals, you're putting yourself in a tough position to be successful in the game. Then how we finish at the end of our counter, right? The classic mistake is I told you that one of the most vulnerable periods in water polo as as you end transition defense and you get into your front court defense, there's a letdown or where you end, where your body position is. If you end side by side and that player is faster, now he's got an opportunity to get inside of you and you're playing six on five before you know it. So we always talk about taking extra strokes, getting to the inside, and getting ready to play great positional defense. Questions on any of that before <clears throat> we go into kind of the nuts and bolts of counterattack? None? All right. So to kind of go into this a little bit deeper, <clears throat> our counterattack, right, we talked about starts with our front court in our front court great balance position one five in the center you need to be deep down on the two meter line you start cheating up or you let a defender start pulling you up you're helping them you're setting them up for their counter <clears throat> it's really important x1 and x5 you know when we talk about this <clears throat> there's so many teams right and, and just so we know one two three four five right in center there's so many teams where if a defender starts doing this, this player starts doing this. So now we're already leaving our attack, but also we're helping them, right? We're, this, is, this is our objective, and their objective's down here. So why would, why would I let this player pull me out? And these two positions, it seems to happen a lot. It's also critical. We know, <coughs> for example, the best centers in the world make the lives of all these players easier because they sit down here on, at the two-meter line or a meter and a half. And we all, we've all seen how that can completely change the dynamic of a team, a center that just hunkers down here in the middle. So then <clears throat> it's really important, a balanced attack, right? You know, we, we can talk about, you know, once we get to defense, how you have the opportunity to dictate how a team attacks. But on the, on the flip side, in our attack, you know, if a player was splitting, for example, and I start doing this, I'm helping them. Instead of, and we'll get to, the, to that later, whether it's this player moving through or this player, depending on the, the zone and split. Then <clears throat> one side finishing, one side closing. Common mistake is, for example, position four, maybe they're in a three, four, is going to shoot, and this player is already doing this, right? This side, this side is finishing the attack. This player should be communicating, I got you, and this side should be covering. So one side finishing, one side covering. Okay, early communication. Okay, also we, we talked about, you know, in, in, in the game here of water polo, a simple thing of communication. Let's just say, you know, this is Tony here and I'm here. And I say, Tony, go. Or Tony, shoot, I got you. That changes his approach, first of all, from a psychological standpoint. But he also knows now that we have him covered. So communication is so critical in every phase of the game, especially here in our attack, to, uh, to have our teammate understand the situation is covered, we're gonna be okay in our transition defense, okay? Then, we, I talked about proactive positioning. You know, I always equate, and I tell our players, you know, imagine everybody's hands are knives. So if this chair, was guarding me, and they have two hands here, would I be sitting and waiting like this? Or would I be like this? So they try to come at me with their knives, their hands are off. Because if you sit and wait like this, right, there's so many players. I may not be the fastest or the strongest, so I have to even be smarter. If I'm guarding a player who's stronger than me or faster than me, proactive position is, is I'm always 
Right. He's ready. Right? He gets closer, I'm going to back up depending on the situation. Or he gets closer, maybe I'm taking him through. But especially at the end of the clock, if I can just, just sit, sit here, here like this, this uh, it's, it's done. done. It's, it's going to be, be a first line counter. counter. So, so proactive, proactive positioning. Then furthermore, right? We know counters happen when players are shooting and a drive's going off, for example, right? We know, uh, 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 I talked about, or a driver going and a, and a, and a pass that may be one out of 20 the driver's going to make. When, when you have the ball in your hand, you, you control the game. If this isn't a high scoring opportunity to this player, why, why would I play it? Because he's going to get kicked in the head and countered. Or I throw an overpass, even worse, and he's going to be countered. And then we talked about the two, right, whether I'm watching a shot, right, so I'm sitting there watching and now a player's caught me, or I'm shooting with a player arriving, biggest mistake you can make. Not only will it be a one on nobody, but chances are it'll be a one on nobody and you'll be swimming to the box for an ejection, or watching a pass to the center. <clears throat> and just one thing with that, you know, let's just say, you know, a team was in a 3-4 zone, right, if I'm this player, right and ball goes into and I, I'm attacking ball goes into the center and this player actually stays out on me I should immediately be doing what backing up if he crashes then the next solution is is I follow him in I step into the free water but a proactive position means you go this way okay I'm stepping in and hoping the ball is going to get kicked out but I'm still in a, po a positive position a proactive position because he's going that way if he stays out on you now you better back up because now you're putting yourself in a position of danger if you don't uh, <clears throat> then obviously every team you know consists of different level of players IQs but you know the, you you need to have those coaches in the water, a smart player with great awareness can absolutely change the situation, right? Whether it's in your front court or in this case, talking transition defense by what they see early, what they're communicating to their teammates, how, how they communicate to their teammates. But the, the, the bottom line is just the simple thing. We are gonna do everything we can that we're in control of to put ourselves in a good situation. So we take say the whistle out of the mouth of the official right again you can't expect an official to see everything that's happening as they go down the pool and they may see the second action so <clears throat> then uh, as far as once we get into the transition we talked about getting ourselves into a safe position getting out in front by several meters we said five meters right a, that's going to put you in a position where there's no duck under, there's no grabbing. You know, the one thing I know <clears throat> from being on the women's side now is I believe women, the women's water polo and the players in women's water polo even have to be more fundamentally sound because there's one huge difference, the suit. Everything is revolved around the suit. And if you put yourself in a bad position in women's water polo, you're going to get grabbed 110%. So getting out in front takes that away right then also <clears throat> early awareness right early awareness is critical knowing where our disadvantage is right and and again we'll get into that a little bit later but you know we really don't want to give anything off the top but having early awareness gives you the ability to start dictating where you want the ball to be finishing with okay couple rules we talk about if you're not beat you should be out in front on your back having your eyeballs up like we said it gives you the ability to communicate obviously if you're beat you're trying to sprint cover to a safe position and be able to get back on your back um, <clears throat> and then again you know when we arrive all the way at the, end of the transition it's a classic mistake a lot most players if you watch any video they're arriving into the vertical position if you're guarding a dynamic player they're going to be on their way uh, uh, getting inside playing uh, not an efficient game and probably playing a lot of five on six so we're going to get to real quick first line counters i don't know if anybody has any questions on any of that no so oh boy oh boy <laughs> all right we're gonna it's gonna become a picasso here so um <clears throat> four first line counters and, and, and just so we can establish.
right? A first line counter obviously is coming either from X2, X3, or X4. Do you think this is a permanent pen? Is that the problem? OK. All right. Well, let's see if that's the case. Hey, it's that guy's fault. There you go. <laughs> Scribble over the permanent over marker the and it'll remove the X, yeah, the X button. Really? Yeah. If you go over like that, you'll erase. Oh, wow. Did you get another? Hey, you're wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, actually, we can start over there with that one. It's, can you see that side of the board? So, dude, what a. Do you want to do you want to pause it real quick and we'll erase it? Sure. Yeah. <coughs> well, you know what? We can. I'll just let's just worry about this down below, and I'll just we'll just leave that up. That's easy. Yeah. And I can leave that goal. We can leave those goals. What? Flip chart markers. Like marker markers, not diaries. Take those away. Wow. I thought everybody did that hack. Yeah. Oh. All right. You got uh, grapes over there? You got grapes? Oh, shit. You got passion fruit? Right. Right? At some point. I think we're in business, right? That's perfect. Yeah. Boom. And that's in the frame? Back to back to the basics, kindergarten here. All right. <clears throat> so you tell me when. Three, two, one. So first line counters. Obviously, <clears throat> we know first line counters. They come from either X two, X three, or X four. You know, bottom line. I believe if if you want to have a chance to be successful. Especially the higher the levels you go, one on nobody's just they, they can't happen. They, they they literally can't happen. Now, look, with the new rules, um, I think it, it's interesting. First of all, if a one on nobody happens, you have to try to chase, obviously, and you have to try to make it difficult. But why is a one on nobody happening? And and what led to that event? Because really, if you give up two, three one on nobodies in a game, it, it, you're done. But you know, a couple things that we've been playing around with. For example, <clears throat> with the, the, the six meter line now. And, and, and my understanding is <clears throat> the way they're going to call it, I was just thinking if you're inside six meters and you touch somebody, it's a penalty immediately. But I, it's not, it's not going to be as easy as that, I guess. But some interesting debates that we've been playing around with, right? So it, if that was the case, and this is a right hand coming <clears throat> down the right side, for example, right? A lot of times you try to chase to the inside and go this way, right? But the, the problem now is, is if you go this way, you're, you're allowing this hand. So maybe it's opposite, right? Where you're working this way, where maybe they have to spin across the goal, for example. That's just something we've been kind of playing around with uh, as far as the six meter rule. Because if it's going to be called where if you touch somebody at all and it's a penalty, then you want to try, just like with the previous rules to make this as difficult as possible. But if you can't touch them and coming around to the inside, it certainly allows them to step out and shoot versus maybe come this way. Now, obviously, if the player was more here, then you would be working inside. But that is something we've thought about <coughs> with the, the, the new rule. Um, but again, one on nobodies, you're putting your team in a difficult position, right? Then when we talk about two on ones, right? The, you know, the reality with all these first line counters, right, we want to try, depending on if it's here or here, sprinting, getting out on our back, our objective is to try to keep the ball and the goal as long as possible, right? And, and the reality here is, is the longer we can keep it in here, the less time for decision making down here. Obviously, the longer we can keep it in here, no goalie wants to have to make that hard pass the further they get down the pool, right? Obviously, you're in communication with your trailing defender, 
goalies in communication usually with that lead defender. <clears throat> Our goals on a counter, whether it be a first line or a back line, right? They're, I call it the line to the goal, right? The fastest route to the goal. You, you want to, and for example here, you want to take these players, either player, especially depending on where the ball is, but even early, off the fastest route to the goal, which I say is the line to the goal. So if I can make them go like this and this, or even further, that's going to allow more time for our trailing player to catch up, as we know. We also say if we can get them off their line or get them to drop to the vertical position, we've achieved our job. We should be ready to make our way back the other way, for example, if the ball was out here. If I get the player to drop to the vertical position, that's a second or two seconds, and our trailer should be coming. Then <clears throat> a couple things uh, uh, that, that are important to note here. Okay? If, you know, the common mistake happens a lot, you know, and it'll probably, if I had a guess, happen a lot <clears throat> over the weekend, but let's just say a two-on-one's happening, and, and we do get this player to go off the line and the ball's out here, and we overcommit, and now this player is passing the line of the ball, for example, and now it's almost becoming a one-on-nobody, right? The worst thing at this juncture, if I overcommit, is to try to go back, because now you're playing in between and you're not making it challenging on anyone. But now, in this case, there's, there's two options here for this player. The first option is to put him under the greatest amount of pressure and not foul. And you would do that if your trailer's way behind, right? So, because you know if your trailer's, call it, three body lengths behind and you foul him, it's an easy pass, easy goal. If your trailing defender is a body length, you absolutely can foul the ball, put a hand up, and hopefully by that time we're arriving to the end. So those two options. <clears throat> um, then some other keys on first line counters, whether it be two on ones or three on twos. <clears throat> There's no, you know, goalies up here concentrated, right? And you're, you're shaded this way and you jump last second. There's no last second jumping, it's done. Now your goalie has no chance on it, okay? Obviously the trailer, it's critical how you swim, breakout speed. By half, you should have your head up for a moment to know where you're going, and we have to establish that he knows where he's going. The last thing, we see it happen all the time, poor communication, two players end up on one, and you have the chance to shut the thing down. Again, communicating right versus left, pointing, if they still don't understand, but we have to get our head up by half, okay? Uh, <clears throat> then, and I, you know, again, I'm just, Briefly covering, obviously there's a lot more nuts and bolts per se for each one of these, but just the things that I, you know, we, we hold really important here. Then a two on three. This is where, or a three on two offensively, but two on three defensively, you know, this is where, whatever, we start working in unison, right? Like windshield wipers of a car. Except there was that one car made one year where they went like, like that. I forget which one, Ford Taurus or something. So this is where we absolutely start working in unison. And the way we think about it is imagine we're connected by a rope. I go this way, he goes this way, or she goes this way, right? So again, our objective, getting out as fast as we can, getting on our back, that puts us in a position A, to have vision and awareness, B, to hopefully get us in between and keep the ball in the goal like we said earlier, the longer the ball in the goal, the better, right? Then <clears throat> we want, we want, like we already said, to force them off their lines to the goal, right? And we can do that while the ball's in the goal, right? Cheating, it's, 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 you see it all too many times in water polo where because you know you're not gonna go that far, the player, the defensive player is just content swimming straight backstroke. That doesn't mean I just this, right? She's, I do this and now her attention for one second is now with me instead of her objective of either getting the ball or going down the pool. So even though I know I may not stunt there or go all the way there and make a commitment, there's no reason I can't make a stunt or a double stunt to get them to go further off their line and or stop in the vertical position. Then, <clears throat> obviously, we want to force Right, and, and, and even with a two on one, but here in a, 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 with a, 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 a three on two, right? We wanna start forcing more passes. If we can force two passes, this is 
slower they're going to come down the pool, the more time, right, more risk, more passes, more risk, but also more time for our trailing defender to happen, uh, to, to arrive. With the two, uh, the two defenders out in front, this is where we go to work in unison. So let's just say the ball is released out here, right? If I go this way, I'm following because we want to force the long pass, right? If I've gotten this player to go off line or stop in the vertical, like I said, with a two-on-one, then you've done your job and you're ready to make your way back. Once we force the long pass, obviously we're recovering this way, and if we can get it one more time, we're in business. So now we're dictating. We want, we know in the game of water polo, more times than not, we want the ball being finished, if possible, depending on personnel look. If the team's got hungry three best lefties in the world, well, maybe you got to rethink it. But then they got the three best righties over here in the world. So, but more times than not, we want the finishing side here. Then, <clears throat> uh, obviously, same deal with the trailer. You know, more important here, there's more people, right, uh, involved, getting your head up early, knowing where you're going, right? Even though no last second change of commitment, you know, the, the, the classic thing is, is this player may be stunting this way where you should be finishing and you see him stunt and now you've changed your commitment and now we're both going back to the middle player. Then, a <clears throat> couple other key things here with the three on two, okay? Especially, you know, again, I don't know how they're gonna call it, but it's, if it's inside the six meter and you touch somebody, then it's even more critical now. Let's say, we're in a situation, balls here, like this. Classic mistake, as this player is coming, right, and almost arriving, you go like this. And now, what are we leaving? And especially now with the new rule. If it's a penalty, and probably in this situation, it's a penalty. You can absolutely try to grab this player's attention, but you can't go and make a commitment until this player has arrived all the way to the inside here. And then obviously on the flip side, and we'll talk about on offense, but if this player is smart, he's probably trying to. But in theory, this could be helpful, right? He's bringing you closer to your next <clears throat> responsibility. So classic mistake in water polo. You know, most of the times trailers are ending here, but when they do end in the middle, they jump. And now you got an inside penalty ball. Okay. Then, questions on any first line counters? Going to be the one-two side, so you can shift over and immediately have a ball. You know it's going to be a wet pass on the four-five side. <coughs> You mean you let the ball out over here? Let it out over there because you know you're going to shift over. I mean, do you? Start thinking <coughs> you about yeah, that, you know. Well, you here's the deal. Absolutely. That's one way to dictate that, right? Then it's just one shift, ball over. Now, ideally, if we can, if we can force two, we're in business. So this is where, and look, this really happens when a team's together for a long period of time, right? I mean, to, to, to get kids to this level and understand that we absolutely look, as they come out, right, we, we want to play in between, make the goalie nervous, play kind of dumb, but we want the ball here. So I'm gonna back off a little bit to let the ball go here. So as they're coming, we hit once, right? We hit twice and now we've slowed them down. Now, absolutely, like you're saying, the easier way to do it, play dumb, we play more, let me clear this up so it doesn't look so crazy, but we can stay closer over here, force it out and maybe let him swim a little longer and then zip and go. The reason I like two passes is at some point, I believe more, more players than not, they're gonna slow their progression, A, as the player's coming towards them. A lot of times, a lot of players freak out and they stop and they lift the ball in the vertical, which is a huge, now, now you've done your job. You get that player to stop in the vertical, you go the other way. But very few players will embrace somebody coming at them and keep going, ball in hand, ball in hand, right? But we know at some juncture, if they have to stop to make this pass and stop to make this pass, we've, we've made more time for our trailing defender to arrive. But you absolutely, that is, you can dictate it either way. Other questions? I just want to make sure I've covered everything here. No? And look, again, 
I, I think these are all things that you guys know. I, I can tell you this, these are the exact same things, whether it had been with the national team or with coaches from RECO uh, that Tony and myself play. It's really, you, the, the game of water polo is not about tricks. It's not a tricky heart. You, it's a simple game. And you really try to simplify it to the, the, the smallest degree. When you simplify it for your players, it becomes much easier to play, per se. Of course, every team, you need to have timeout plays and uh, uh, certain schemes or tactics. Um, but again, you know, probably some of you are going, wow, this is pretty much stuff that we've heard. But this is, this is what we hold most dear, no matter the level, whether it be age group or college or, quite frankly, all my experiences internationally or with the national team. So... <clears throat> Then, uh, oop, make sure I'm not on the wrong page here. So, second line counters or back line. So, we talked about <coughs> a first line counter x2, x3, or x4. Back line's coming x1, center defender, x5. So, this is the first. This is the second. And, and I don't want to be confusing, but I know I'll say it. I won't always reference this as second. I'll say back or front. Okay. Then, <clears throat> the, you know, the, the, the easy thing to do and understand, and we'll, and we'll talk about it more on offense, but a second line counter, whether it be offense or defensively, is the same as a first line counter. The only difference now with a second line counter is you have three more players involved, per se, that hopefully are all the way down, and we'll talk about that on offense. Okay, from a defensive standpoint, <clears throat> okay, uh, uh, having help, per se, off the first line could be crucial, and there's a lot of situations, especially when there's a righty down here, and we'll talk about those things. But, you know, if there's not great separation between your first line and second line, now these defenders can come into play and help slow down the advantage here for our trailing defender. So <clears throat> everybody understands a four on uh, or a three versus four counter defensively or a four on three, right, is the same as a one on nobody. But you have these three players that should be already be down. Just like a, uh, a five on four is the same as a two on one and a six on five is the same as a three on two. It's the exact same thing. So. <clears throat> For a three versus four counter, right? Obviously, you know, and, and, and for me, this is absolutely probably one of the most uncommon counters that we see and our, our least likely counters that we see in a game. It, 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 it can happen, but we're not seeing that as much as a five on four or six on five. But I think, and, you know, again, for our first line defenders, we already went out over it earlier. You want to sprint, get out in front, and have vision right and know where the advantage is coming from obviously <clears throat> we're trying to keep the ball uh, as long as we can in the goal here at this aspect you know if a goalie plays the ball to the first line they're doing you a favor because the ball is going to go back to the second line and that takes time and your your trailing defender should be arriving then no matter where and we'll just say here the classic right this is where i said now we have another line of defense for our help if these two lines are close then that gives this player for in this instant, maybe the ability to slow down the progression of the player coming on the second line. Now, what we said too is, is this player can never overcommit so far and leave a three on two, for example, behind them or an easy slam dunk. Okay, then, <clears throat> you know, as they come down, obviously this player, you, you know where you're going. You're, you're not gonna commit more than likely to a first line. I don't really know any example that you would do that. You're gonna be arriving probably to the second line player because that's the closest player. Right, as these players come down, <clears throat> you know, for our first line players, can we get to a blocking position? But we would never want to get pulled so far where we leave something free behind, right? Then, also, okay. 
it's really important. There, there is opportunities, let's say, <clears throat> you know, and this player, you, you want, if you can get a hand in, but the last thing you want to do is be concentrated so much on blocking and this player slips away, right? Goalies should feel great that they know where the ball is coming from. One thing that we do know in this situation, if this was a right hand and say this player was coming this way, can you stunt? Depending on how close they arrive to the first line, can you force a ball down where this player only has an opportunity to catch and shoot, not an opportunity to sneak in behind and fake, fake, fake 100%. But there is opportunities, especially when a right hand is down here on the wing. Then, five on, uh, uh, five on four, or four on five, right? <clears throat> I'm not gonna repeat the first line. We're out in front, right, on our back, sprinting. Again, now, now we know this is the exact same <clears throat> as a two-on-one. A lot of times, we know that this can happen. There's a lot of teams that like to play pressing, right? So say ball comes out to the right, <clears throat> for example. And press, press, they're pressing. And the center defender is passing the line of the ball. So this is now and he should be opening towards the ball, and we'll talk about that. But now this has turned into a classic five-on-four. They've overcommitted, overpressed, and now they're leaving a five-on-four solution. Also, we know that this can come off. <clears throat> In the college game, we know there's a lot of posting up going on. Maybe these two players, and you know, the center defenders already beat this out, and these two players are not even in the mix anymore, whether it be a post up from you know, on the two posts or three posts. So we know, bottom line, five on four is the same as a two on one, right? So again, if there's an opportunity, because the first line isn't swimming uh, fast to slow down the second line, great, but we're never going to leave a first line counter by over committing. So, <clears throat> and again, as, as these players are, let's just say the ball's here and we're opening, and we're opening, right? It's now a two on one situation with a trailer here. And now it goes back to the same concepts. Can, can, you know, again, a lot of times we want to force the shot from the right side. So depending on where it's happening in the pool, where I'm at in the pool, if it's early, I might be able to force one pass and recover. If it's late, right, I'm going to stunt, 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 but I know I'm going to work my way this way. And again, it goes back to the same communication we talked about on a two-on-one and, and telling early and knowing early where we're going. And, and for me, the, the, the real, the important thing here too is, is a lot of times these backline counters are developing later, meaning after half, especially on a five on four. So that's where going back to what Trent said, you, you, you may have to change how you dictate where you want the shot from. You may not have the ability or time to force two passes. So it's stunt, working, working, hoping he's coming and go. And now if it's early, I can force him to play the ball once and twice. Then again, <clears throat> one thing I said, uh, I didn't say with uh, uh, four on three, but same as a five on four, we're playing above if we can, obviously, because otherwise if we're behind early ball in, one of the best opportunities in water polo, right at the end of the transition, ball in, and then some sort of potential two on one situation after an exclusion. Then uh, <clears throat> uh, six on five to quickly go through it's basically a repeat of, of the three on two. It's the same principles. Early, we can force two passes. Late, we're, we're stunning, stunning, ready to recover. And again, all our job is get them off their line. So get them to go out, get them to drop to the vertical. You've done your job, recover. So when you break it down, <clears throat> um, and when we go over this with our teams, I feel like the really the easiest way to explain that is just understanding there is absolutely no difference of an advantage coming off this line than this line, except maybe you have an opportunity to slow down the second line with the first line defender because the, the team you're playing isn't swimming and putting great separation between their first line and their second line. And again, now we're going into unison attacking here on a six on, fi uh, a six on five counter, windshield wipers. Uh, <clears throat> I get questions on any of that. Talk a little bit about the second line. You're just on five counter, say you have a double post. 
those situations, and X5 gets down quickly, and essentially it's two on one out of that four to the six on five counter. How do you play with, with that? Like, say, uh, one post and five, ball turns over. Hold on, let me. So, you're saying there's a post up here? Post up there, right? Center's on the other side. And then. Um, like oh, this? Oh, no. Put, draw it in a 3 3. So, just pick anybody for. Get rid of one or five. Yeah, get rid of that guy. Okay, so you have your three on t your three. three so like this, right? Okay. So now it's clear that X that X five is going to be the first person down. He's going to be the fourth man, and your center defender and the post up defender are in a two on one coming up out of the backcourt. Now, are you saying from a defensive standpoint? From a defense, you're going to offense. <coughs> I'm going. To, I'm going to be on defense. But you're asking, what are we doing defensively? What are you doing defensively? So you're so, so these, these players, players right? Down. Two meter line. <coughs> deep right, center or deep left. Deep right, right? Yeah. Now, more than likely, I mean, again, it depends, right? Ball comes in here, crashes, this might be the player committing, right? I mean, it can change depending on the situation. But what you're saying is this is the fourth player? It's clear, obvious. Two, three meters, he's the fourth guy. He's going to go to the two post, two meter line. Right, right either out one, or, right. right? And you've got a clear two on one out of the backcourt. How do you play it with your defenders down line? So, so let's just say, so now we're in a situation where, this player's moving over and we're down here, you're saying? Right. Well, I mean, for me, this is the, the, the exact same thing, depending, it, it's basically a two on one again, right? Again, early, well, first of all, ball on the goal, I mean, it, it kills me. You know, I remember when we were kids, I mean, the objective is if, you know, and I'm in the middle, I'm like this, it's playing cat and mouse early, right? It goes back to, that's why he's simplifying the game. It goes back to, how can I mess with this guy for as long as possible for him to not want to keep, or to put the ball out? But then, and we'll talk about that when we get to offense, there's nothing worse for a goalie, two players swimming like this. At some point, you have to open to give comfort. But again, it goes, this situation is absolutely the exact same as a two-on-one, right? I'm in between. The longer, if I can keep that ball in, now we're arriving to half. Now I know more than likely I'm going to be stunning here, right, but ready to go back over to here for the trailer coming here. If ball comes out early, I'm going to hit once, recover twice, and hopefully our guy's on his way. And again, we'll watch video, but there will, I can assure you, be moments where this guy isn't committing down the way he can. So you may even have help over here because this guy's taking his time. Oh, we don't have a counter, so I'm not going to go hard. And, and, and that becomes, uh, and we'll talk about on the offensive side, how important these guys are on the first line, even though there's not an advantage on the first line. They absolutely are the key to the success of the second line. So again, I would play this the exact same as a two on one, or a one versus two. Questions? So I think just, I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Sprinting, getting out on your back, how long can we keep the ball on the goal? Do we have time to force multiple passes, or is it a stunting, slowing down, slowing, slowing, and then recovering? Can we dictate which side we want the ball out depending on where we are in the pool? <clears throat> so the cliff notes for this, we absolutely can dictate how we, our opponents play. Okay? We do this by having a great balanced front court, one side finishing, one side closing. We do it by getting out early on our transition defense, getting on our back not watching balls going to the center or shots or shooting with somebody arriving. If we're out in front early, then we have the ability to start dictating what the, uh, the transition offensive team is doing. Okay. Also, it allows us to start forcing them to make more passes, more risks, slower they're going to go. Right. Also, it gives us the ability, when we have the ability to be out in front, it gives us the ability to stunt, which we know can get them to go off their line or drop to the vertical. Right. And then some other key things. <clears throat> with the trailer. Obviously, communication is vital so you know where you're going. The worst thing that you see is that zigzag swimming. Oh, I'm supposed to go here. Oh, I'm going to go there. Oh, and now it's done. So it's got to be very clear. <coughs> so a proactive front court leads to great transition defense. You know, I think also there's the psychological part of the game, 
where you want to get into your opponent's head, right? And your goal is from when that ball turns over and it's in the goalie's hand to start putting them under psychological pressure about those things that we talked about. How long can we keep it in there? How can we force them off their lines? <clears throat> How can we force the ball to be thrown to this part and to be brought back? So it's actually, it, like we all know, it takes effort, but you'll thank yourselves because your life will be made much easier here. So any other questions uh, as far as transition defense? Let's just see where we are. You guys need to leave at 5.15. Yeah? I gotta go right now. You guys should bolt. Maybe we'll just go, maybe we'll cut this in half. What do you think? Half today, half tomorrow. Does that work? So then we'll go, trans then we'll just start with front court defense and stop there. How's that work? <coughs> I guess I have just one question about the transition real quick. Do you talk to your players at all about um, any differences you make, changes about if the ball is out early? You know, because there's some a lot of teams that like to get that ball out early to make the defense work, right? Um, opposed to having the ball at the at the goal. Yeah, I mean, look. Any changes? Any changes? Oh, I got one. Make? Thanks. That's. <laughs> I'm not used to talking this much with the mask on. Can't talk anymore. So, uh, yes, look. And I didn't get, that's the nuts and bolts, yeah, and right? And Personnel, yeah. right? Uh, uh, yeah. The situation of the game, the, there, there's a million piece, parts that come in, right? But I think that's the big one because it falls out early. Right. What to do and it falls in the, within the goal. That's, that's right. What to do. And, and absolutely, I think the one big thing there, ball, like I, we were saying with Trent, ball out early, you know, I think from an offensive standpoint is great because now you have more time to read and be prepared for the finish. But it also allows a team, if they, they're coordinated and have coordinated movements, right, the ability to try to slow you down. So from a defensive standpoint, ball out early means that we should probably be able to at least do one revolution, evolution, right? One, two, force the ball where we want it. Ball out late, like Trent said, maybe you say, we're just gonna play dumb, make the ball go out left, and move once, for example. So absolutely, and then obviously, the higher levels you go, I mean, what players, shooters, you know, those abilities, I mean, <clears throat> obviously also what players put you in great danger by the, the, the way if you, if you don't get yourself out in front. So yes, I mean, those are the finer nuances, um, but those are things that we'll talk about depending on who we're playing, you know, team-specific things. That's right. Right. Well, that's one of the, the, the best things, right, is these two, on a first-line counter, and really on a second line, too, I would suggest these two players are kind of cheating out a little bit more here, right? That puts more pressure here, right? But those are the things where, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this. I don't want to go in too much because every coach has their own philosophies, but I would. That playing a ball here with two people surrounding them is more dangerous per se than us being in here and putting an easy ball out for sure. So um, then next, the next phase, um, and let me just pull up one thing here. So front court defense. <clears throat> I think the important aspects um, to understand, and I said, you know, the greatest period of vulnerability in water polo is the end of our transition defense and into our front court defense, right? Just like we know all the coaches say, you know, for the most part, the best time to get your center of the ball is right at the end of the counter, right, when there's no help. If we can transfer the ball from side to side, no foul in, we're in business. More times than not, there's going to be a positive <coughs> um, action happening. So with that, there can't be any letdown from the transition defense into your front court defense. And um, like I said, you know, those are the most vulnerable movement, uh, moments. And <coughs> at the end of the transition, 
you know, and, and those are things with our players that we're watching. The worst thing, whether a player is swimming on his back or stomach, but for example, they're on their back, and this player stops, and you stop. And now I'm in the vertical position. And it's a game of leverage at this point. Water polo is a game of leverage. So now they got me, right? And, and, and every team has dynamic players, you know, and, and obviously I can list a whole bunch of dynamic players. You know, you do that per se to a Johnny Hooper and you stop in this position and he's gone. And there, you know, or you do that to a Thomas Koshas or a Sopich who physically will take you and move you and, and, and the list goes on and on. So the reality is, is maybe the ref will catch it and maybe they'll call an offensive, but more times than not, why would you want to put the percentages or your cards for the referee to make something when you can take care of it yourself by arriving to a safe position so they stop, I keep going a couple extra strokes and get my butt up and get into a defensive position. And if I want to move back into the lane, I can, depending on where the ball is. So how we arrive at the, off the end of the transition into a proactive defensive positioning. Like I said, it's so funny when you move from phase to phase, <clears throat> if, uh, more times than not, the athletes are thinking that there's a period where time stops. But the game never stops. The smart teams, the smart players are going to take advantage of that. So how you end off the end of the counter, Okay, then um, what we do know is a successful transition defense and a successful front court defense is going to give you the opportunity to at least counter and more time, right? If the ball's in the back of your net, there's no counter. Now, there's different philosophies. There's some coaches who will leave before they even have the ball which is not right or wrong. There's some coaches who don't leave until they have the ball. It's a, it's, a, if it, it's a difference of philosophy and not one's right or wrong, but what we do know is, is if you don't have a successful transition defense into your front court defense, you won't have the opportunity to counter, period. And, and whether that's with an advantage or without. So some of the, <clears throat> the goals of our front court defense, right? We wanna limit the number of high percentage shots that our goalies have to see. Also, we want to keep the clock running as much as possible. We also want to make our center defenders, right? Everybody's objective, I would think, more times than not, is, is you would like to play pressing, especially right at the, the beginning of your front court. So you want to make your center defender's life as easy as possible. Then, <clears throat> also, we want to play an efficient game. So, you know, if, if the player thinks about it, right, if I work for these five seconds, that might save me another, depending on women's or men's, 35 or 30 seconds. Because if I end in a great position, then I'm going to probably have less of a chance to be ejected. Or if I play great positional or great drive defense for these five seconds, or my favorite in the front court, and we'll talk about that, is just the positioning at X1 and X5. If I know I'm tired when I come down here, if I sit here versus here, move three feet of water, I could save myself and my teammates more times than not at least 30 or in the women's game 35 seconds because this player could be in and now we have an exclusion. So if you work proactively, you can play an efficient game by not simply having to play more defense in this phase. So we want to play as little five man as possible. And then one of the last goals is, is we constantly, with our defense, want to put our opponents under great duress, stress, right? So some of our front court defensive standards starts with our offense having a balanced attack, our awareness, we always know where the ball is, our player, the area, what's going on in our immediate area, what's going on at the center position, the clocks, and when we get good enough, can we anticipate what the what our opponent's going to do <clears throat> then correct body position at all times never caught in the vertical the vertical is basically a a sentence to have to swim to the corner more times than not so foul only to prevent a goal or a pass that could potentially lead to a center pass or and or to a goal okay now depending maybe in a certain situation you're playing you know steal the foul or whatever it may be or foul the steal 
but we, we, we don't want to stop. We want to keep that clock moving when possible. We also never want to allow a goal from a center or a post up, but that usually always starts, you know, with, like we said, a proactive position. Just this makes your life easier. This probably prevents somebody from swimming in, right? Ball here, for example, and this player going like this, just being here saves him. Being here, and now we're not playing an efficient game anymore. So we don't want to give a goal from the center or post up, and more times than not, you find that action happening you know, somewhere else in the pool, which leads to that action of a post up or a center goal. Unless we talk about, you know, look, if we have a, a center post or uh, pushed out to five, six meters, then we'll let, let them shoot, even four or five meters, depending on who the player is, et cetera. Then we, you know, one of our philosophies is, is we don't want to go until we know we have the ball, per se. Now, again, there's different philosophies. There's people that will go early. There's people that will take that risk, you know, but I, I, like, I like to know before we go, we, we've secured the ball. Um, then communication is our strongest weapon. Some, <clears throat> some basic rules, you know, for pressing and zone defense. This is where we'll move through this quickly because I feel like everybody has different tactics and they're all, they're all good and not one's right or wrong. But I feel like just some of the, the basic things that are really important to understand. So when we arrive off the counter, okay, we should always, like I said, take extra strokes getting to the inside. And that's dictated by where the ball is. So the ball can't move quickly around, as we know. Um, obviously the two meter guard or post up player trying to take away ball side immediately at the end of the counter we're always proactively thinking ball player uh, area center clocks anticipation that means head is constantly if I go away from my player I better still be able to check and know that my player hasn't changed his location then when I foul I want to try to foul through the ball so it denies a quick pass but also every time I foul I put my hand up this is this could change this could be the difference of your year quite frankly. If I foul somebody, right, and I put my hand up, that absolutely triggers a reaction on the player who you fouled. Should I shoot? Should I pass? If I want to pass to the center, what kind of pass? Because I can tell you, playing against Kashas, for example, foul, right? If you, if, you did, if you were like this to this instead of immediately, he had the ability to slide a ball in to Molnar and these players. But if I had this ability, now he has to take a ball that's going up and over, and now either, depending on the location of the center, the goalie or your teammates have the ability to crash. So foul, hand up. Also, we know these players, uh, uh, okay, Kashas and, you know, Tony, obviously, outside the five meter, but now I guess six meter, right? Foul, you don't put a hand up, and even though the ball's here, and they're whipping this thing off. So this changes the decision making, they have to at least think now for a second, should I or shouldn't I? So we always talk, as soon as you foul, hand up. Then in a press, the ball should only move position by position, which you guys know. The ball should go from one to two, so that allows our center defender time to readjust. It can't go two to four, we know. Then <clears throat> no live balls, right? No live balls to the center. A live ball, four to two and in, we know. It's a positive thing. Either some sort of shot, penalty, exclusion. Then we, we always say, you know, that's why I said an efficient game. There is a seventh, or I shall say eighth, defender, which is the two-meter line. And, and, and for me, <clears throat> it's one of the hardest things to get through to somebody. There, this, th we have to understand. Now, I guess on some after goal plays, there may be a lefty, but this guy, all he needs is this and into the center, his right hand. This, you have this to help you. This position is crucial. A live ball from one or five to the center, it, we know. And we, 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 we call it, it's a cardinal rule. No way. The only way this guy gets a ball is this way. And now you have a decision. I go foul, goalie comes out. Or I back, or we, we know we can at least get into a zone. So X1 and X5's positioning is so crucial. <clears throat> then also X1, X5. What we do know,
is your helpers for drives. Now, I know there's some teams, again, I'm not getting into the tactical part. There's teams that switch. There's teams that absolutely, you know, if they're beat, this player immediately goes here, this player goes here. But the higher levels you go, I, we're thinking, you want to do that, then we're going to do this, and you're going to be in trouble. I mean, my belief is, especially for the younger players, you're trying to create a mentality. So the easy thing to do is, is, you know what? Every time you get beat, just switch. So what do you think the player in their, high, their mindset is just going to be? I, I'm not going to play. All I have to do is I switch every time. Now, look, as you become a real team and you organically grow, there's going to be situations where you have to switch. But I believe to really create a defensive-minded player, their thought process, we don't switch, period. But then we know X1. Let's just say he's beat. We know X1, for example, is a helper. But how we help is so crucial. We know most places, most people, immediately they see this, they go straight back. Right? Now, this is open to things, right? This player can step in. But also, I have, depending on how I do this movement, right, I have the ability to, let's just say they're in a 3-4 zone, to put the fear in this player, should I or shouldn't I throw this ball, while maintaining a passing lane to here. And so, for example, if that's x1, and this is 2b, and I'm here at x1, the classic mistake is to go straight back here. The way it should happen is, is I'm here in a proactive position. All I'm doing is opening my left shoulder in my left hip. So I am in a position. I can't tell you. The players always ask, how far should I go? You should go as far as you can recover. Every player moves different distances, right? But I know I don't need to be here. There's no reason. Also, here means, guess what? Now we probably have to do what? switch and now I'm in a bad position to potentially be posted up so how we help here on the wings I'm in my initial x1 position instead of doing this now what are we always thinking on defense ball man I don't have what vision of who now my man so I open up my left shoulder and I'm working on an arc here where I'm on my legs I have vision here Johnny has the ball over there at four. Does he really want to? Look, he starts moving here. I'm still here. If this player starts wrapping up, now I take this leg, and now I'm going like this. So I still have this and potentially this, or at least a shot block here. So the reality is, is going shooting straight back, you're, you're giving a clear advantage where you could be stuck and you have to switch, you're also losing the location of your given player where, you know, I just have to put the fear in this passer that I'm here, right? I'm here, but I got my legs set to where if this guy's in close, I might be able to grab this ball in the passing lane, but no matter what, I'm ready. And then what we can talk about later, but how this player recovers, gets to the inside and gets this player out. But how we help at X1, X1 and X5 are the correctors. Then, and we're, we're going to finish up and stop with this, but how, so how we're working on this arc, how I show my hands and recover to the inside, the classic thing on drive defense. As the driver slows down, the players who's beat slows down. It's incredible. A lot of times when these drivers open, they stop. And this player slows down. Instead of, if I just keep swimming, I'll arrive because this ball is coming from one of these three positions. So I arrive, so players stopping here, I arrive all the way to here, and it doesn't end because now we know that potentially this player has the ability. I get all the way here to the inside, and now my next job, if there's no ball there, I need to push this guy out, especially in the first three, four seconds. I put pressure on him, then he's probably not going to stay in and post up. Then, <clears throat> again, you know, I talked about really the one time that you probably would switch is if you help like this and you get hit here, then you're going this way. But again, you're putting yourself in a vulnerable position. 
this ball can come immediately in. So then <clears throat> how you choose to play drive defense is up to you. You know, we, we've used always a counter rotation, which allows you to have your eyes on the ball and the center, right? Versus if this player moves and I just swim like this, now I have no clue where the ball is or maybe a ball that's being played to the center. We also, our objective in a press, <coughs> the ball's here. We want to force the drives, obviously, straight down, away from the ball. Then, <coughs> um, obviously, in a press, when we're pressing and we are beat on a drive, how we recover, with what kind of urgency. But if we're truly pressing, then the ball should be under pressure, and that shouldn't be an easy pass. Okay, then obviously we know, especially now, and again, I, I, I want to keep saying five meters, but it's changed. You know, X3 is so critical. I mean, basically, these players now are all centers, right? They're all fighting for the six meter line. So X3 has three responsibilities. Best shooter in the world trying to work, he's got to know. Best shooter in the world trying to work, he's got to know. And then obviously, got to know what's going on at the center position. So X3 is critical. X2 and X4, how you communicate with X3, is obviously also really critical. Then, uh, then obviously, the communication of how we stay in a press, right, can be with goalie. A lot of times, our defender is in full combat, so they can't say anything. But if we're in the right position here, we should have vision of everything. X1, X5 can be communicators. We, you know, it's, it happens all too much where teams just immediately fall out of a press when you don't really need to. If you just stay on for a second longer, your defender can make his way. But we fall back and we let him off the hook. Then <clears throat> a couple other things would be uh, we never want to get pulled so far out of a helping position. If somebody's drifting back towards half court, then I'm going to be ready to come back. Right? Also, our center defender, we have to be careful how high we're fronting, right? Depending, you know, there's, there's some defenders that move so well. You know what? Their players out, the center's pushing out till it's four meter, four meters or so, but they move so well, they might be able to go the high side. But we know more times than not, if the center's moving out high, you better be ready to go back down underneath, right? Um, then, in a press, if the ball's to the center, everybody's got to be ready to crash. You know, I know this. For us specifically, we have to sharpen up our relationship between our defenders and outside players because our defenders, right, whether we're in a press or in a zone, crash is arriving. What do they do? They put their hands up, and guess what? Crash slows down, doesn't go all the way through the ball, and now we're given a goal because our defender assumed that the crashing players would take it. So how we crash, how you crash all the way through the ball until you have the ball is, is a critical element. All right, we should probably stop there. What do you think?